Welcome everyone to Bitcoin Optech newsletter number 295, recap on Twitter Spaces. Today we're going to talk about a bandwidth wasting attack, a discussion about transaction fee sponsorship, fee rate estimation using the mempool, five interesting questions from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. We're going to go through the Bitcoin Core 27.0 testing guide, and then we have our weekly releases and release candidate, as well as notable code update sections that we'll get into. I'm Mike Schmidt. I'm a contributor at Optech and executive director at Brink Funding Bitcoin Open Source Developers. Merch? Hi, I'm Merch. Hi, Merch. Dave? Hi, I'm Dave Hardy. I'm co author of the Optech newsletter and of the third edition of Mastering Bitcoin. Peter? Yeah, I'm Peter. Hey, Peter. Abubakar is not present yet. David, do you want to introduce yourself for the audience? Hi, I'm David Gumberg. I'm a new contributor to uh, Bitcoin Core. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I think Jeff from the LDK project will be joining us in a bit as well to help us go through some of these interesting LDK PRs later so he can introduce himself then. We're going to go through the newsletter sequentially here, starting with the news section. First news item is disclosure of free relay attack. Peter, you posted to the mailing list an email titled, A Free Relay Attack Exploiting RBF Rule Number 6. Maybe to start, maybe you can get into what is BIP-125's Rule 6 and in what way can it be exploited? Well, I mean, there isn't actually a BIP-125 Rule 6 because we forgot to go and uh, put it on the BIP. But... Uh, Basically, what it is, it says that the fee rate of a trans of a well, when, when there's a transaction replacement being considered, the fee rates of the replacement can't be less than the transactions that are being directly replaced. And this basically, um, you know, what what this does is it prevents transaction replacements that don't make sense from a miner's point of view because they're reducing the overall fee rates of the mempool and. Uh, the attack I disclose is just a variant of uh, well-known attacks where essentially you find uh, some kind of transaction that is likely to get mined, but is less costly for you for some reason, um, if it does get mined, and then double spend it to some nodes mempools, but not necessarily others, with a low fee rate transaction that is not that costly to get mined, but it's quite large. And I, and I should say, um, uh, sorry, not 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 else, guys. Um, that is unlikely to get mined because it has low fee rates, and you just incrementally double um, double spend it with more and more and more large transactions using a complex bandwidth. And eventually, the transaction that you did want to uh, get mined, or at least isn't very costly for you to get mined, does get mined, invalidating all of these replacements that used up a bunch of bandwidth. And you know, there are many examples of these types of attacks. I mean, one example. Um, would be, for instance, timing something correctly with a coin join, where you know you wanted the coin join to go through, but while that transaction happens, that's you know paying a lot of fees and is likely to go through. You double spend it with a low fee rate transaction, where you know that transaction is, isn't very um, uh, you know it, it isn't very interesting and. But, you know, you can go and just use a bunch of bandwidth uh, getting these propagated. So the specific uh, variant here is just taking advantage of rule, uh, rule 6 directly. But, you know, like I say, there's other examples of this too. So Now, I know there, there was some discussion and back and forth. I think, Dave, you, you, were, you were part of that, maybe not directly on um, this particular issue. But, Dave, are there thoughts that you have on this particular bandwidth-wasting attack in, in the way that it was described by, by Peter? It, it sounds like this is a variant of a known attack. Um, well, you know, Peter, in his email, he describes, uh, you know, a, a very well-known way to waste bandwidth, which is for you to send, an attacker to send a bunch of, you know, large transactions, get them relayed across the network, and then have a miner very efficiently conflict those transactions, removing them from the mempool. So, uh, you know, you could have nodes relay, uh, you know, literally gigabytes of data, uh, across the entire network, terabytes even, um, and then for 
a rather small amount of uh, block space use, uh, remove those from the mempools. And that's another variant of free relay. Um, I mean, Peter's absolutely right. There are ways to waste uh, bandwidth. This is a new way to waste bandwidth. And that's what we really, that's one of the things we mean when we talk about free relay, relay is we're just talking about wasting bandwidth. Now, free relay, I guess in this case, is that the, there's an assumption that you're already transacting and that, that that transaction you'd be happy to, to go through for, for some reason. So because of that, there's no additional cost to, to do this attack, but that it, there is assumption that you're doing one transaction at least here. You, you eventually would want at least a transaction to be confirmed. Is that right? Um, sorry, my, uh, my internet cut out for a few seconds there, so I might be repeating something that was already said, but... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, free is on a continuum. Um, I, like you said, at one ex, at one extent, it could be arguably completely free. Um, you know, it could also be very cheap. Um, you know, there are, of course, other attacks where you just broadcast the same, um, you know, the nearly the same transaction to as many different nodes at once, and they just waste bandwidth relaying all the different variants back and forth and not coming to any useful conclusions. So, you know, in that case, that would be a cheap uh, relay attack, arguably. But even then, depending on you know what you were what you were intending to do at the same time, even that can be uh, uh, what's arguably a free relay, relay attack because you're already needing to do some transaction anyway. And uh, I, I think the example I uh, tried to explain with CoinJoin is uh, an example of this kind of thing too. It's Peter, so what what do we do about it? Well, I mean, as I argued in my post, uh, this particular variant. Um, it happens to be a example where replaced by fee rate um, improves improves the situation there because you know this particular variant of this type of a class of attack happens to be an example where the attack works because of economic irrationality, right? Since the high fee rate transaction is the one that got mined and the one that obviously would be likely to get mined no matter what. That was all. That was always the one that Minode should have accepted into their mempools. You know, it does not make sense to go and waste bandwidth on a low fee rate transaction when a high fee rate uh, replace exists in you know most circumstances. Because the reality is, a high fee rate one is the one that's going to get mined. And I've checked this on uh, real world testing, where, um, or sorry, you know, real real world uh, uh, monitoring of the Bitcoin network. And sure enough, something like you know maybe 65 70 percent of high fee rates but um low absolute fee replacements do eventually get mined and if you go fix this well you know that that certain circumstance will happen a little less often it still is uh, probably fundamentally impossible to fully mitigate things like people just broadcasting different versions of essentially the same transaction to many different nodes at once that's probably an unfixable problem in uh you know, how Bitcoin fundamentally works. But there's limits to how big of a problem that can be and how much extra bandwidth it can use. And of course, you know, that type of attack, it still has some cost because at some point, you know, you at least needed to go and do transactions. You know, if you're just an arbitrary attacker who has no need to do transactions, you're going to at least incur some cost with all these things. You don't have to do some transactions. And fortunately for us, the cost of bandwidth you know, in the sense that you can only use up so much bandwidth for a given number of UTXOs mined, that cost is very high because, you know, bandwidth normally is relatively cheap and Bitcoin fees are high enough that, you know, these kind of ratios don't get you that much. So, I'm, you know, I'm not too worried about these kinds of things, but I think the better argument is it does mean we can go and do things like uh, replace by fee rates, which are very advantageous for other reasons because, you know, they don't actually change the status quo. We talked about replace by fee rate in newsletter number 288, and we had we weren't able to have Peter on for that um, spaces, but Dave walked us through that particular proposal. So if you're curious about what, what Peter's referencing, you, you can check that out. Um, Merch or Dave, any further questions on this topic? Thumbs up from Dave, thumbs up from Merch. Okay, great. Uh, Peter, any calls to action for the audience before we move on? I don't know. Subscribe to mail and let's follow the discussion. Thanks for joining us, Peter. You're welcome to stay on, or if you have other things to do, you're free to drop. Thank you.
Next news item is titled Transaction Fee Sponsorship Improvements. And this was a Bitcoin mailing list post from Martin Habovstek, um, who posted an email titled, titled, Anyone can boost a more efficient alternative to anchor outputs. I reached out to Martin. He wasn't able to to join us today, um, but I think we can represent his ideas as best we can. This is an idea that's similar to Jeremy Rubin's fee sponsorship idea from early 2020 that we covered in newsletter 116. Uh, We do have both Peter and Dave who responded to Martin's post on the mailing list, so um, I'm glad they're here to comment. Dave, you are also contributing to some of the discussion going on on this topic on the Delving Bitcoin forum as well. Maybe you can summarize the original fee sponsorship idea and then also what's going on with these resurrected discussions. Sure. Uh, Jeremy's original fee sponsorship idea um, is that we can add a commitment in a transaction. Jeremy proposes putting it in a special off return like output. Uh, we can put a commitment in a transaction that commits to another transaction uh, and creates a relationship to them that's pretty much identical to child pays for parent relationships. So you have it, you receive an output and you spend it. Um, and we can't include the spend until we include the original output, the transaction containing the original output that you received. Um, and we use that for child fee parent, child pays for parent fee bumping uh, in Bitcoin Core. It's the same mechanism used for ephemeral anchors, which you've heard us talk about a lot uh, in previous newsletters and podcasts. Um, but what it, what it allows is any transaction to contribute fees towards a, another transaction. So the sponsored transaction, the one that contains the commitment, cannot be included into a block unless the boosted transaction, the transaction it commits to, is also included in the same block. Um, and uh, you know, this would be a very interesting mechanism for adding fees to a transaction. One of the nice things about it is that you can kind of outsource uh, who's paying the fees. Um, You can also eliminate one input from a child uh, pays for parent transaction because you don't have to have that reference um, in a transaction. So like in femoral anchors, when we want to boost a parent transaction, we have to create a transaction that has both the uh, anchor spend in it and also a fee contributing input. Um, With sponsors, we can just uh, create a transaction that directly sponsors the the uh, the transaction we want to boost. And um, so I think this is a really clever idea. Uh, people were interested in it when Jeremy posted about it, but there was concern back then that child pays or, or ancestor fee relationships in the mempool are not very well handled. Uh, and we really needed to improve that part of the code before it could be carefully considered. Um, And fee sponsorship hasn't been talked about a lot uh, since then. We have a topic page and it looks like we only talked about it, you know, five times in the last few years. And the last time we talked about it was in October, 2022. So I don't think Martin uh, simply had not heard about this idea. And he seems to have independently uh, reinvented it. Um, His idea has a difference. Uh, Since Jeremy posted in 2020, we've activated Taproot. And so Martin was able to propose a version that makes the commitment in the uh, transaction annex, the the witness annex. that's part of the discounted segment bytes. So for an identical commitment to what Jeremy proposed, uh, Jeremy proposed of adding 32 bytes ish plus of, of some overhead to a transaction. Um, so we can, we can reduce that by 75% in Martin's proposal. Um, it's actually a little bit better than that because uh, Jeremy's version used an output which has the overhead of an additional eight plus one bytes uh, for the uh, the amount and the script size. 
Um, so Martin's version is a lot smaller. It's you know like eighty five percent smaller than Jeremy's version. Uh, it brings the cost of a sponsor down to eight V bytes. Uh, Jeremy's original proposal allowed multiple sponsors, although Jeremy uh, wanted the initial mempool policy to keep it simple to only allow sponsoring a single version. So we would have to upgrade consensus for sponsors. Uh, that would be a soft fork. Um, and we would initially start with a very restricted policy. And then as we gained experience with it and as our tooling increased over time, we could allow transactions to sponsor more than one. That was where it becomes especially beneficial to begin outsourcing the sponsorship. So uh, I could pay Merch over Lightning Network and he could add a sponsorship to my transaction. There doesn't need to be any, because there doesn't need to be any relationship between the transactions, uh, except the ones that's explicitly made by the sponsor, anybody can boost my transaction. That's how we get the title of Martin's post. Uh, after Martin's post reignited some discussion about this, I saw it and Jeremy nudged me into posting on Delving, uh, something that he and I had discussed a few months ago, which was increasing the efficiency of sponsors even more. Um, and for this, we the simple version, we can just use an implicit commitment. If you create a transaction that is clearly a sponsor, um, then you can just assume the transaction appearing before it in a block is the transaction it's being boosted. Um, you can have your signature commit to the TX ID of the transaction appearing before it in the block. And that signature commitment doesn't need to go on chain. It's something that nodes can derive for themselves and can and just don't need to be explicitly made a transaction. This brings the cost of a single uh, boost from a sponsored transaction down to zero. There's just no cost at all. Um, and that's just a huge advantage over almost everything except for uh, replaced by fee. Replaced by fee can, in most cases, I see you want to talk to Mike, I'll, I'll pause in a moment. Um, replaced by fee, you know, in the ideal case, it costs you zero also. Um, so this gives you kind of uh, child pays for parent like uh, capabilities at the same cost that you would pay for replaced by fee. I'll pause for a moment, Mike, so you can talk. Yeah, I was I was curious in that implicit relationship. It, it, it seems like the, the structure within the, the block, the order within the block, is important. How, how would that work in terms of relay for that particular idea? So I think you would just use package relay the same way you would use with ephemeral anchors. So in ephemeral anchors, the uh, the first transaction, uh, the one that so the first transaction may have zero fee. And the ephemeral anchor may also have no output value. So by itself, it's not something that we would relay because there's no fee, there's no reason that we would ever mine it. And one of its, its outputs is below dust. So it violates one of our existing policies. But in ephemeral anchors, we allow that. If it's relayed in a package with an additional transaction that spends that anchor output uh, and contributes the fee through child pays for parent. So we're already, working on upgrades to the P2P protocol to allow relaying uh, packages of transactions that have a defined order. Uh, and uh, so we can just reuse that mechanism for the transaction to be boosted, uh, which is kind of like the parent, and the sponsored transaction, which is kind of like the chi child. Does that answer your question? Yep, that makes sense. Um, I apologize for derailing. I, I, I know you're, you're on a groove here, so Keep going if you can remember where you were. I can, I can. Um, so the, that mechanism, uh, which is what I, I proposed to Jeremy uh, in January or February, um, that, that's really simple. Again, that gives us zero uh, overhead uh, sponsorship. And I think that's really cool. Jeremy ran with it a bit farther. Oh, oh go ahead, Peter. I, I just want to be clear. I mean, when you, 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 when you say zero overhead sponsorship, what you really mean is 
zero marginal overhead sponsorship, assuming that there is a second transaction. You know, for an average person with wallets, you know, they would not get zero overhead sponsorship without a third party who can go create another transaction for them or already has another transaction for them. That that is correct. I, I should have said that. Um, as as Peter explained, uh, if somebody's already creating a transaction or already has a transaction in the mempool that they're willing to uh, RBF, uh, there's no additional overhead uh, to make that a sponsor. However, if uh, nobody's willing to do that for you, if you don't already have a transaction in the mempool, uh, a new transaction will need to be created. Um, so you have, it's, I think it's less than the cost of uh, ephemeral anchors there. It's actually significantly less because again, you're not creating an additional output and spending an additional output, but it's still a lot more expensive than uh, the ideal case for RBF. In fact, pretty much any case for RBF. Um, so uh, running with the uh, the idea, Jeremy suggested that uh, several ways that we could um, allow multiple um, boost from a single sponsor using basically this mechanism. Uh, we can't just use transaction ordering to do that because of the existing requirements in the mempool uh, for transactions to be in uh, ancestor dependency order, um, and also because uh, you can have multiple sponsor transactions that all sponsor the same boosted transactions, and that will be if there was a, a required ordering. Those orderings would conflict. Um, so what we can do is add a single small item to the witness stack uh, that miners can use to indicate the order of the uh, transactions in the block for verifiers and that when the transactions being relayed over the network can also be used to express the TX IDs of the transactions to be boosted. Um, the, the summary there is that you can have a uh, arbitrary number of boosted transactions and the cost there is uh, 0.5 V bytes per boost, so half a, a virtual byte per boost, um, and then and in that case, you know, uh, when somebody is already creating a transaction uh, and is willing to add one or more sponsors to it, we have a very efficient mechanism for again, again an unlimited number of sponsors in a block. Um, this is. This has still encountered concerns about the complexity of doing this in the mempool. Um, there's been discussion about it. Um, I believe uh, Suhas uh, Dattoir is, he's just very concerned about creating additional dependencies in the mempool. And I can understand that. Um, this is the same type of dependency that we have with child page for parent and ancestor fee rate selection and mining. Um, and that's the source of a lot of complexity. So I can understand him not wanting to add more complexity. Um, but I would, I would like to, I would hope that we can solve that problem at some point. I think that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, I see merch. Yeah, I wanted to jump in there a little um, bit. Um, so I think that I, I could see a case for sponsoring a single transaction. And again, I would agree with Peter. You only have a marginal cost of zero if you already were creating a transaction, which I don't think is necessarily a um, given. And I f I'm very concerned about the proposal to be able to sponsor multiple transactions with a single sponsor because um, for example if you require that the uh, transactions that are being sponsored are all in the same block as the sponsor how the proposal originally starts then just actually bumping one of the transactions into a previous block makes um, the sponsor invalid and removes all of the other uh, the sponsorship for all the other transactions or like if you can only have a single sponsor for the transaction the question is how how do the replacement mechanisms work 
it all uh, reminds me very much of all the issues we already have with CPFP and packages, just in a different flavor. I'm I'm not sure whether uh, it is quite the um, I, I'm I'm not that excited about this proposal because I think that a lot of the things that we're trying to do with CPFP or package relay track transactions um, address exactly the same issue. And if we do not discount the cost of the additional transaction, it's only a cost reduction of about a third or so in the in the worst case. And um, yeah, I. It, it's a lot of new um, ideas and changes I, for a little cost savings. I'm not sure it's it's as clear of a uh, improvement. Yes, Peter. I I want to point out that this type of mechanism um, also enables entirely new smart contracting mechanisms. Um, you know, Arc I think is your best example here, where it has this idea of connectors, and we might find that this type of mechanism gets reused for something completely unrelated to uh, fee sponsorship in some kind of arc connectors fashion. And, you know, whether that's good or bad, I mean, there's a lot of complexity there, but like, I, you know, I, I, I did, I, I don't believe it was mentioned before and I want to appoint that but although I certainly do agree with you that there's a lot of complexity, these kinds of things add um, because of the necessity. Well, maybe not quite necessity, but because of the desire to make sure that sponsorship only happens within the same block rather than adding a sort of generic utxo like mechanism minus the fact that you know it's spendable uh, i'm not yeah dave go ahead um i mean those are, those are both uh, excellent points um i'm not that concerned about reorg safety uh i think that's something we have to discuss and i'm, I'm going to work on a separate post uh, and a separate topic to delving sometime in the next few weeks about that because i want to collect some data for the network about um how we're actually using transactions um i think i think it excites me uh the idea of outsourcing this um which means that there, because there's always going to be somebody making transactions. There will always be somebody available to uh, add a sponsorship. Now, the, the, there is a problem here. It's discussed uh, on the mailing list and on the delving post, which is there's no trustless way to outsource this. So you can't pay over Lightning in a completely trust-free way uh, for somebody else to sponsor your transaction. But I think thinking forward in time, we have uh, second layer protocols like Lightning that people might want to use with an exogenous fees mechanism like CPFV, including a specific variance like ephemeral anchors. Um, and that implies everybody has to keep extra, every single user, has to keep extra UTXOs around. And as block space becomes uh, a higher premium and UTXOs, there's just not enough to go around. Uh, I think we have to look at mechanisms where people want to use Bitcoin in a trust minimized fashion, uh, but they don't want to keep around an excess number of UTXOs. They want to be part of, for example, a giant channel factory or, you know, some sort of, you know, a covenant, like a join pool kind of thing. Um, and they don't want to keep around a separate UTXO to use for fee pumping in these cases. And a mechanism that is very easy to outsource and very cheap to uh, make that commitment, um, this enables that kind of behavior. So I think just thinking forward, we're probably gonna go to a direction where people won't have UTXOs um, and in, for, for fee bumping. Um, and in that case, we have to switch to uh, either endogenous fee mechanisms like RBF or some sort of outsourceable exogenous fee mechanism like fee sponsorship. So I, I think this might be a problem we're going to run into anyway. Um, anyway, okay, go ahead, Merch. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to address another um, post in that thread, and that was that uh, we're we're trying to save um, bytes here, but really what we're trying to achieve is to make it easier to to outsource debumping 
of uh, third-party transactions, and or rather to bump it to third parties to to um, sponsor our transaction. But we could do the same thing already with an ephemeral anchor that is anyone can pay, and if we count the transaction that has to be created or just an input that has to be added to a transaction that is already to be created, the fee savings or the, the byte savings would be 50 bytes. Uh, now, I, I kind of want to reject that we currently have a huge block space crunch because we saw last year how BRC20 tokens at times took 50% of blocks and were not priced out. So... Um, I, I think currently we're at least not yet where we're really, and also just the adoption of Taproot, for example, as a way more block space efficient output type is not that fast. So clearly people are not desperate to save a few bytes. So if this mechanism at all were interesting, why is nobody opening up their transactions to be sponsored by anyone by attaching uh, anyone can spend outputs that that as, as hooks for like anchors for bumping if i i just don't really see people wanting that um i think peter made this argument about uh, his time stamping service at some point yes it's great if you make progress in some manner but you as an issue of something of some transaction want to maintain some control over um, like what is the most attractive transaction to be included so that not only you make progress but you sort of um, maintain agency on, on which progress you make and if anyone can attach to any transaction you sure maybe someone else pays for it and you still make progress but you have extra work with, re with consolidating your processes so I, I'm just not super convinced on that we want everybody to be able to sponsor every transaction. I, I, I'm skeptical about the the ability to sponsor multiple other transactions in a single transaction, and I'm not sure if we overall even see demand for the use case. I, I also wanted to point out um, where you mentioned that, you know, you can always go and create ephemeral output. Um, you know, with a little bit more improvements to package relay and so on, you can always go and have a protocol where you sign a variant of the transaction you have with the femoral output. And if needed, you just use replace by fee to to get that transaction and potentially sponsored. Sorry, I can't understand you. I was not able to get the quietest place, but I, you know, basically, you you can always have an a, a transaction with an ephemeral output as a backup. Right, because you'd always sign two versions of the same transaction, one with such an output. So if protocols have this need, well, they can obviously just do this as a backup. And in the future, once we have package replacements, this will be quite a, a reasonable way to go and, um, you know, to go get a transaction bumped. And, you know, in general, I agree with you. Like, let's see how that plays out first rather than going immediately to consensus changes. Uh, I'll just say I'm I'm also on. Let's see how ephemeral anchors plays out before we go to consensus changes. I, I do explicitly say that in the thread. Um, this is I think this is a very interesting idea. I'm I'm a lot more excited about it than Merch is, uh, but I do agree that this is something for down the road, not something that we should do next week. Uh, I point out in the thread that I think it really wants a new witness version. And uh, so I think it should be something everybody has access to. It should be like a taproot thing where uh, anybody can do it. I realize there's some conflict with that, perhaps. But uh, so I think it's something for whatever the next big uh, protocol change is, uh, something we can bundle into there rather than something that we're going to activate separately, like a lot of covenant proposals and new opcode stuff. is something we might just add a small thing to script. This is a big thing. It should be bundled with other big things. It's an interesting set of uh, technical topics that we covered, but also kind of pulled on some threads of, of philosophical topics as well. So I'm glad you all were here to, to riff off each other for that. 
And Dave, thank you for representing Martin's post and, and some of the ideas you and Jeremy had on transaction fee sponsorship improvements. I think we can move on. Next news item titled Mempool-Based Fee Estimation. Abubakar, we recently also had you on the show to talk about cluster fee estimation in newsletter and podcast number 283. And we also had you on in newsletter and podcast 276 to talk about a PR review club around fee estimator updates. So you've done quite a bit of work around fee estimation. And this week, you posted to Delving Bitcoin a thread titled Mempool-Based Fee Estimation on Bitcoin Core. How would you summarize your latest work here? And, And maybe before you do that, you can introduce yourself briefly for folks since you missed the intro in the beginning. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm Abubakar Sadiq Ismail, a Bitcoin Core contributor being supported by HRS Builders. Yeah, I've been working on fee estimation on Bitcoin Core for quite some time. And it just happens that the first issue that I work on was on fee estimation. Yeah, so uh, last week I make a post about mempool based fee estimation. It's an issue that I've been working with, uh, with Clark. Uh, to introduce a uh, fee estimator that look as look at the mempool transaction data or make it estimate because uh, we have analyzed like the fee estimate that is being given by uh, the current fee estimator we have on, on Bitcoin Core, which is C block policy estimator. And sometimes it's overestimate and underestimate. And I made an analysis and discovered that there are quite sometimes that transactions have been uh, stuck by in the mempool because they use estimate smart fee. So we decided that uh, we are going to uh, run the block building algorithm on the mempool and take uh, the uh, 50th percentile of the block template as the fee rate estimate for the next block. and. When you create a transaction using that, there is high likelihood that if it uh, were to be propagated into the network and miners are going to pick it. But there, there are some issues with the mempool based fee estimation, which is what is in your mempool might not be the same with my, what miners have. So there, there are some ideas because this is a non issue. So uh, contributors have been discussing about how to fix the C block policy estimator that we have, and some sanity checks have been proposed, which is to look at the previous blocks that were mined to see if they are the same, or I will say roughly the same with what uh, you expect. So you are going to uh, check if, like maybe the past three blocks are roughly in sync with your mempool, and also your high mining score transaction are confirming. Then there is likelihood that your mempool is roughly in sync with miners, and when you make an estimate with mempool, your mempool transaction is uh, going to be the same. So we implement the fee estimator, and then we run some analysis. We have like up to nineteen thousand uh, estimates to see how it compares with C block policy estimator and uh, the expected block uh, median fee rate. And mostly it's been uh, much more closer to the expected uh, block target uh, median uh, fee rate than C block policy estimator. And that's uh, the progress so far. And I have received uh, feedback from David about the attack vector, which is uh, miners being able to manipulate the notes menu by having like two variants of transaction, but casting the first one with high fee rates and mine the second variant, and then they can be able to basically manipulate what users have. And also uh, David uh, hints a research by Kale Al on mempool-based uh, fee estimation previously, which uh, uses the mempool data to lower uh, C block policy estimator estimates and that is an improvement to the current status quo, and it uh, reduced the overestimations that we are having on C block policy estimator a lot. But there is still an issue of underestimation, which uh, you can RBF bomb, but 
the issue is that even if you decide to RBL bomb and you call estimate smart fee, it is still going to give you a uh, low fee estimate. So I think the solution that users currently do is to look at uh, some service like mempool.space to see uh, the state of the mempool and then RBL bomb using um, a fee estimate that mempool.space is giving them. But uh, that is even more risky because there is trust there and it's better to look at your notes mempool than to look at uh, mempool.space. Dave, I saw you chiming in in the thread. Abubakar's invoked a couple of your comments here um, about a particular attack in some previous research from Kale on the subject. How would you augment or, or comment on, on what Abubakar has, has outlined so far? Yeah, I think this is this is uh, great work. Um, we've I think we actually posted in a previous newsletter where BTC Pay moved away from Bitcoin Core's fee estimation because they thought it was overpaying, um, and it does have an issue uh, where it's just a it, 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 it's a trailing statistic. It's a very heavily trailing statistic, whereas a full node would seem to have in its mempool. Uh, a really good view of the current network, you know, uh, in an ideal world, uh, every mempool and every node is basically the same, including minor nodes. That's an ideal world, not the real world. But if that were true, uh, the coin, you know, full nodes would know exactly what miners are going to put into their next block, assuming those miners are trying to maximize their revenue. Um, so this is, this is really good work. And, um, like Abudakar said, uh, I really liked an idea of Kali's from back in the day uh, for at least starting on this project, uh, which was just use current information in the mempool to set a lower fee, but don't use it to raise your fees. Uh, because if there's any attack out there, any motivated attack, it's going to be for miners to try to raise their fee. So you can just uh, ignore a whole class of problems, a whole class of profit motivated attacks by using your mempool data to lower your fees, but not using it to raise your fees. Um, I do think uh, it's really great to see him uh, research ways to also use mempool data to raise your fees. Um, like he said, you know, you underpaying is also a problem, especially if you continue to underpay. I don't think it's uh, always a problem. Anybody who can RBF multiple times, which isn't everybody for sure, but anybody who can RBF multiple times can just keep incrementing their fee rate until their transaction gets confirmed. And they can do those increments relatively quickly and relatively cheap. And the minimum increment is one sat per fee byte, and uh, there's no significant time delay the, between that. You can increment your, your transaction you know, 100, 100 sats per uh, fee byte in a single block very easily. Um, so, Again, for people who are who can use RBF, um, I think they would benefit from a a kind of a quick uh, change to the fee estimator. Uh, is a, a new optional mode to the fee uh, estimator that use mempool data to drop the fee rate to what's being observed in the mempool right now. If it's lower than what the long term uh, block-based fee estimator is returning in Bitcoin Core. And then in the long term, continued research on trying to find a way to extract useful information for fees from the mempool and use that to choose an appropriate fee rate, especially for people who can't RPS. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question. So when you're talking about RBF fee bumping, is it an automatic uh, fee bump or you manually just, uh, increment like five sat per V by continuously until your transaction get confirmed? Because even if you like make an make a fee estimate again, it's still going to be that uh, low fee estimate because there is a threshold. 
Well, one of the requirements of RBF is that each time you fee bump your transaction, it has to go up in fee rate. Um, the, the reason for that is simple, is that miners are not going to allow you to send them a new version of a transaction that pays a lower fee rate uh, or also lower absolute fees unless you're using uh, Peter's RBRF. Um, but it has to go up in fee rate. Miners are just not going to accept anything. So if you just keep working at RBF, even if you have no knowledge of what's in the mempool, even if you have no fee estimator, if that's all just dead, you can start uh, uh, your lightweight client at one sat per V-byte, send your transaction away to block. If it's not confirmed, send it again at two sats per V-byte and just keep incrementing until your transaction eventually gets confirmed. So I, again, if you can RBF, uh, you, there's not a problem, not a necessary problem uh, with your fee estimator underestimating. You will eventually, through RBF alone, get to a fee rate that's high enough to get the transaction confirmed in the block. That's not an ideal situation for a lot of people. They want accurate fee rates because they want the transaction to confirm relatively soon. They don't want to iterate through every possible fee rate. And it's also better for the network to have um, accurate fee rates so that people aren't using more RBFs than necessary, which uses a lot of bandwidth on the network. Um, so again, you, you, you know, I absolutely agree. We need uh, accurate fee rates, um, but I, I do think there's no actual problem with underestimating fee rates for people who can use RBF in a non-time non sensitive manner. Merch, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions or comments as well here. Yeah, I also find the idea of just lowering and making it opt in as a new like experimental mode for how fee rates are estimated by Bitcoin Core, uh, maybe a very easy first step on how we could deploy something. And um, I agree with Dave that the natural way of being thrifty with your fees is to um, risk underestimating and bumping appropriately over time. And in a way, the problem is just inherent to, to Bitcoin transactions because we don't know what the next block interval will be. There's always um, the estimated time of finding the next block is always 10 minutes, whether it's been 10 minutes already, whether it's been 10 seconds, or whether it's been 50 minutes already. So if you uh, estimate, we, we have a first bidder auction we estimate at the start uh, where we submit our transaction and at least once per day we get a, a one hour block where you will just underestimate if you want to be in one of the next few blocks um every once in a while we get a series of five blocks in a minute and you totally overpay if you if you assume that you'll have to wait about 40 minutes for the next four blocks so and um, there, there's just a lot of things that we don't know when we estimate the fee rate. So being more thrifty and being able to adjust later is um, at least for an active user that, that can work on their transaction pretty safe. And that way we could at least recoup some of these fee savings quickly by lowering the initial in estimates. Abubakar? As we wrap up this news item, I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to say anything else as we wrap up, but also give you an opportunity to give a call to action to the audience if there's some something that you think would be valuable for, for them to look at or, or play with based on your research. I know you have a... Um, uh, it looks like you have a you have a branch with with some of this implemented, as well as a a Google sheet with some data that people can play around with. What what would be useful for you to get feedback on on your research here? Yes, yeah, so I have a branch with a working RPC, so you can build the branch on mainnet and call the RPC and see how it works. But uh, I would like uh, like feedback on the thread, just as uh, we are discussing with David and um, the way forward. And uh, I think the stage that uh, it is currently is to uh, have the fee estimator with the mempool based fee estimator with the C block policy estimator threshold. And then uh, if you want to RBF bond later, if you estimate the fee and it's you know, low fee rate, it's win stock, then maybe you can uh, 
get the memory states manually and then decide on that. So we are looking at displaying uh, the first quartile of the next block templates, 50th quartile and the fourth quartile. And also we are looking at see if, uh, maybe we can uh, incorporate the inflow of uh, memory transactions in our decisions. We decide on which um, metric to use. Yeah, so it's still a work in progress and all feedbacks are welcome. Thanks for joining us, Abubakar. You're welcome to stay on, or we understand if you need to drop and do other things. Thank you for having me. Next segment from the newsletter is our monthly selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. We have five of those this month that we've highlighted. The first one is, what are the risks of running a pre-segwit node? And, and the example version here would be 0.12.1. I believe I've seen some chatter on Twitter about this particular version, and I guess the idea is folks are who are upset with inscriptions and BRC twenties and things like that are are trying to feel productive um, and taking a stance against that by potentially running a pre segwit node. And I think that may be part of the motivation behind this question or why it's come up recently. A few different people contributed answers to why there might be risks associated with doing such a thing. Merch, you are one such person that provided some of the answers there. Um, we list a lot of the potential downsides for an individual node operator. And then we also noted um, the potential effects on the Bitcoin network if, if a substantial percentage of the network adopted such a version. Um, Merch, what, what do you think? This is this is a bad idea, right? Well, yeah. Thanks for taking my conclusion already. No, um, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> people that listen to this show know that I have not a ton of love for for BRC twenty tokens or inscriptions. I generally just don't find them very interesting. And, um, but I. I think it makes sense to look at the issue at hand and the solution on just like analytically. And um, what exactly are we trying to achieve by running outdated software? Uh, is an, like, if I'm running a pre segwit node, currently there's 95% of all transactions are segwit transactions. So your node will consider them non standard, simply not load them into the mempool, will not forward them, will not have seen them when the block comes through. Um, basically, they're no longer participating in transaction relay. Well, if if the bandwidth savings that you have by doing that are the goal, then just run blocks only mode. It'll be a hundred percent transactions that you don't forward. You only see the blocks. You get all of the bandwidth savings, but you're not running a version that's been um, released eight years ago and has been end of life for seven years. So, whatever security issues have been fixed. Uh, since then that may have been present in the code base already and the um, operating systems they're running in that may have changed underneath of the software and have introduced new compatibility issues all of that you get by running eight-year-old software and I, I just don't see how the goals um, of or Maybe maybe it would be easier to assess what they're trying to do if they actually stated what exactly their goal is. But um, the perceived goal of not forwarding inscription transaction throws out the baby with the bathwater here. And in that it also throws out all of the other transactions that are on the network. So it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And from what it seems to me, the all of the downsides basically affect the node operator. They will be peered with less preferentially because they are never the ones that first forward blocks because when a block comes in, they first have to get all the transactions. So they'll have more round trips, more data uh, spikes at the times when blocks are found. Um, they'll. Uh, I, I believe that most other nodes that still follow the 
uh, current version, they would just form preferential. Uh, they would preferentially peer with each other because we protect the nodes that first give us a block. I think for the last four blocks or so, they're among the nodes that we will not disconnect. And so what will happen is that the network basically segregates itself. People that actually um, broadcast transactions and uh, get everything before the block comes through and can participate in compact block relay, they will be the first ones to relay to each other. They will form some sort of backbone in the network. They will be not really affected, especially miners are super well connected with each other. So one of the arguments has uh, from this group of people has been that it'll slow down blocks by people that... Um, or by miners that include inscriptions. Yeah, it'll s slow down your receiving of those blocks, but it doesn't really hurt anyone else that that is actually running up to date software. So, I I, I just I'm overall confused by what people think this is supposed to do and whether they thought about how it affects them. And yeah, I I, I just don't think that it's useful in any way. Next question from the Stack Exchange. Speaking of embedding data. When is op return cheaper than op false op if? And this was answered by Voitech, who detailed some some chart showing if you're going to embed data using op return versus op false op if, which is the sort of the way that inscriptions uses the, that their data envelope is is sort of this if false, um, and then embedding a bunch of data. So when is it cheaper to do the inscription embedding versus op return? And his conclusion was op return is cheaper for data smaller than 143 bytes. Next question from the Stack Exchange. Why does BIP340 use SECP256K1? And a great person to answer this is Peter Willa, who did, and he explained the rationale of choosing SECP 256K1 versus the alternative, which was inferred in the post, which is this ED25519 curve. And I think the person asking this question um, implied that there was a more mature ecosystem around um, the non-ECDSA uh, scheme. Um, and, I, and I think what Peter addressed is that I guess that assumption is false, that a lot of, of what's been built recently that looks like it's part of that alternate system um, has actually been built over the last few years. And then SIPA also um, notes the some of the schemes predating BIP340, MUSIC1, MUSIC2, FROST, um, and also some standardization efforts around BIP340. And I guess the, the conclusion that SIPA gave for uh, for the choice is two uh, reasons. One, the reusability of existing key derivation infrastructure within Bitcoin, and he notes including BIP32, as well as not changing any of the security assumptions since Bitcoin is already relying on similar security assumptions. Merch or Dave, anything to add or augment on that? Great. Next question from Stack Exchange. What criteria does Bitcoin Core use to create block templates? Mertz, you actually answered this question. So perhaps you'd like to provide a, a summary of the answer. And then also perhaps Abubakar, I think you're still around. You might have something to say given some of your work around um, fee estimation as well, um, if that's impactful here. Merch? Yeah, sure. So um, we currently use an ancestor set based approach. So when we look at transactions and um, their priority to get picked into the block, we consider them in the context of all the transactions that have to topologically go ahead of them uh, in order for, for the transaction to be valid. So if you have a child transaction, the parent has to be in the block before you, otherwise you're not valid to be included, right? So um, obviously when you look at a tree of transactions, uh, transactions that are further down in the tree will have overlapping ancestries with tr transactions that are higher up in the tree. So the implementation in Bitcoin Core, what it does is it calculates the ancestor set for every single transaction 
then looks at the total size and the total fee of this group of transaction and calculates an ancestor set fee rate. And at that fee rate, we queue the transaction. But that is probably not the final fee rate that we use to evaluate the transaction to go into the block because when there is some transactions up in the tree, further up in the tree that have a higher ancestor set fee rate, they get picked into the block first, and then the fee rate of the remaining transactions in that tree gets recalculated because now the ancestry is pruned and there's less fees left for, in average, more more size. Otherwise, that transaction would have been picked with all of its ancestors before, right? So we we basically we reevaluate the same ancestor sets multiple times in bigger clusters. And that is sort of a little inefficient, but yeah. So we, we look at transactions in the context of the ancestor set. Uh, also maybe noteworthy is that this is a greedy approach. So this is not a perfect solution that gives you the optimal fees for the block, but rather it's just a fast and quick best effort, which is take the transactions from the highest fee rate first, and then especially at the tail end of the block, where we uh, might have transactions that are bigger than the remainder of what's left for the block template, we get um, a bit of a bin packing problem where we have to find the best things that fit into the end for the optimal solution, which we do not do. We just exclude anything that doesn't fit in our greedy template so far and then look at smaller transactions that might feel fill the hole so um what i'm trying to say is we do not actually find the optimal blocks we find just pretty decent blocks it's maybe something like 0.7 percent that i've seen um clara and i wrote a little paper or not paper but article on on block templates a couple of years ago about this and uh, we found looking at historic data that finding the optimal block is just less than of a percent of a improvement for the most part and so yeah in this context of course cluster mempool is interesting where we would have more information about where we would put transactions into the block because we essentially create a total order of everything in the mempool we know exactly in what order we would pick everything into blocks so we we will build slightly better blocks still not optimal blocks and um maybe also interesting in this context is the bin packing problem gets a lot harder when transactions are bigger. So for the most part, the greedy approach works decently because our transactions are so much smaller than the block size. So for example, today on Twitter, I saw some people discussing whether we should raise the limits on standardness so we could have bigger transactions. And this would make it harder to build a good block with a greedy approach and basically require us to do a lot more computation to find an optimal block, which would favor bigger miners that can afford more computation more quickly. Uh, so yeah, um, maybe that's more than an overview, but amazing. Uh, amazing. Thanks, Merch. Uh, Dave or Abubakar, any questions or anything to add on, on Merch's great elaboration? Yeah, yeah, that was great. So I think we use the block uh, building algorithm to get the top block templates and we rightly noticed that it can be inefficient because of its uh, algorithm currently so what we do is we cache the fee estimate that you get so if you want you can just cache uh, get the cache data so i think it's uh, we cache it after one, one minute then we update so when you make an update and the cache is above one minute and you get a fresh estimate. But if you want, this is opt-in, you can get a uh, uh, latest estimate. And also for us to like uh, ensure that uh, the mempool is roughly in sync with miners, we have to like immediately- oh, and thanks to our guest uh, Rodolfo block and Bashtian uh, for joining us and my co-host Dave. And compare it with the new block before uh, we make the decision. And if, 
this uh, to be deployed and everybody is using it, then that will slow block propagation in the network a bit because uh, after a new block is in mind, then everybody has to calculate block template. But I think with cluster mempool, it's going to be uh, much more easier because we have total ordering of the mempool and we just take the uh, top block. Thanks, Merchant Abubakar, for elaborating there. We have one more question from the Stack Exchange. How does initial block download field in the get blockchain info RPC work? Which is seemingly the most uninteresting question that could ever be surfaced on the newsletter. But I always find when uh, Sipa answers something, it just always seems much more interesting to me. Um, he gives some uh, insights that at least I wasn't aware of. So in, in the case of this particular question, Sipa answers that um, initial block download always starts up uh, when, when you start your node is always true and then only goes to false when both of the following conditions are true. One is the current active chain has at least as much cumulative proof of work as the hard-coded constant in the Bitcoin Core software, which is updated each major release. That's the first condition that needs to be true. And then the second one is that the timestamp of the currently active chain, uh, chain tip is no more than 24 hours in the past. So I thought that was interesting insight, if um, a bit in the weeds with a particular RPC. Merch, I know you, you had some comments on this with, with SIPA. I don't know if you thought this was interesting or you wanted to surface that discussion at all. Yeah, I did think it was interesting. So um, the... Or I, I don't really want to get into the comments that we had underneath that post, but I wanted to provide a little context because um, maybe people aren't aware of what the context of initial block download is. So when the field initial block download is true, our node behaves differently for syncing purposes. So while we're in the initial block download mode, we first sync only the header chain up to the best chain tip that our peers are providing to us. And then um, we sync only from a single peer, I think with a fallback to a second peer if, if there's some delays. And uh, only once we've caught up to the last day or so of blocks that we're missing, we resume our normal peering behavior where we invite all of our peers to give us blocks and transactions. During the initial block download, we also do not do transaction propagation, for example, right? So basically what we're looking here at here is um, if you don't start your node more often than once per day, or if you're currently in the initial sync, uh, your node behaves differently than when you're caught up to the chain tip. That wraps, wraps up our Stack Exchange questions for the month. Next section, releases and release candidates. Bitcoin Core 26.1, release candidate two. We covered this in, in last week's discussion, um, so there's there's not much that, that we got into there. But Merch, Dave, or David, do you have anything that you'd like to note on this release candidate before we move on to 27.0? Great. All right. Bitcoin Core 27.0 release candidate one. David, you posted an initial testing guide for this release last week. Um, maybe you want to introduce yourself since you, I think you missed the beginning. Oh, no, did you, you did the intro. You did do the intro. Um, but maybe you can give us some background on how you came to author the guide, and then we can get into some of the notable features to test. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for having me. I... I co-authored the guide with um, three other with three other people, um, Chris Berkf Berkfist, Marco, and Tom. And um, we worked on this testing guide as a part of the Chain Code Labs onboarding to FOSS program, um, which has been um, a really amazing program. And uh, we're really grateful to all the people at Chain Code and all the contributors that have uh, given so much of their time to help new people find their bearings um, in this in this space so that's kind of the the background of of how we how we can all four of us uh, came to work on this great do you want to get into maybe some of the uh, notable features that you surface during this testing guide write-up sure 
Um, so I'll, I'll go through it in the same order as they appear in the guide, and uh, feel free to stop me. Um, the first issue we cover in the guide is a change in the way that we store uh, the mempool on disk. So previously, the mempool was stored in plain text. And as we discussed earlier, or as, uh, yeah, um, people can encode arbitrary um, sequences of data into Bitcoin transactions. So this, this, this poses a problem. Um, uh, malicious ma malicious um, people could, uh, enco could encode um, data that would be detected by antivirus software, potentially. Um, so now we um, obfuscate the w our mempool on disk um, the same way that we already do with chain state. Um, so that's the first, the first change is that we are now XORing the mempool. The second um, and a big one is that V2 transport is going to be on by default in version 27. So previously in version 26, V2 transport that was described in BIP324 was available, but it was behind a command line flag and all of the RPCs that used it, used it you had to um, enable it with a flag. Now in version 27, it's enabled by default. So all connections will automatically attempt to be made, uh, will all be made, uh, will first try to be made over V2 and all of our um, networking peer-to-peer -peer RPCs will also attempt to connect over V2 first. Um, there's also some early support for the V3 transaction policy um, behind a command line flag and in test nets. Bitcoin Core now has some support for V3 transaction policy, and we also covered this in the testing guide. Um, the, other th the other addition is a new coin selection algorithm, uh, Coin Grinder, um, made by Merch. Um, and this and today, this algorithm is only used in um, in a in an extremely high fee environment. Um, and it optimizes for using the smallest possible input set, but isn't as bad. Oh, go ahead. No, I, sorry. I just want to knit. It's above 30 sets per V-byte, which I think, um, currently is higher than, than what we're seeing in the mempool. It went down to eight sets per V-byte recently, but, um, it's, it's not that extremely high. The... The reason why we are not running it at every fee rate is if you always pick the minimal uh, input set by weight, the problem that you get is that you grind your UTXO pool down because you will create very small change outputs and you will not consolidate ever. So the idea was when do we really want to uh, minimize the input weight? Well, when the fee rates are somewhat high. So that's why it's only run at 30 sets plus. Uh, please continue. Um, yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Thank you. And uh, also in the PR, it's noted that that may be extended to other use cases in the future. Um, the other uh, change that we cover is a um, net info compatibility. So previously, when um, if you had an older version of um, of Bitcoin D and you tried to talk to it with um, with a Bitcoin CLI client that was uh, version 26 or higher, um, it would crash. So um, this fixes this release fixes a bug, and that's covered um, in the testing guide. And lastly, um, while there aren't any major user changing faces to the Migrate Wallet RPC, um, as of version 27, it's no longer um, experimental. Um, and the Migrate Wallet RPC is important because um, as early as version 29, we might um, deprecate the legacy wallet or remove the legacy, remove support for the legacy wallet completely, except for the ability to migrate to the newer um, descriptor SQLite wallets. So um, we also covered that in the testing guide. Um, and there are other notable changes that we... Um, couldn't necessarily find a way to um, include in the in the testing guide, but um, those are the ones that we thought um, would be helpful to test.
David, thank you for putting that together. I know there was a PR review club on the guide. Did did you attend that? And, and if so, how do you think it went? Yeah, um, I attended that. It was hosted by um, Chris Bergfist, uh, one of the co-authors of the testing guide. It went really well. Um, we had a lot of people show up and um, a lot of people try out the guide. Um, it was It was very exciting. One thing I like about these guides is it's highly accessible for people to play around with. Um, but on the flip side, then, it's um, if you only strictly follow the guide, maybe you're not fully exploring all the different things that could potentially be tested. Dave Harding, I believe you were on our show for the 26.0 testing guide, and you had a particular emphasis in that discussion that I see alluded to in the newsletter right up this week, which is the phrasing of suggested testing topics. Maybe you can comment on testers going beyond the testing guide itself. I think my comment last time was that, you know, go through the testing guide, but also have fun just exploring stuff. Uh, run all the commands that you typically run when using Bitcoin Core. You're looking for things that developers didn't expect because if they expected it, you know, it would be fixed. It would be working correctly. So just have some fun, run some commands that you normally wouldn't run, learn about them. Um, but. I think testing should be, you know, it should be part fun. So just have some fun while you're testing. David, I assume your call to action for the audience would be going through the testing guide and running it on, on whatever environment folks have set up and then also provide feedback on the guide. I know there's 29.685, which is for feedback to, to the guide. Anything else you leave for listeners, David? Yeah, um, I just to kind of echo... Um, but what Dave said, I think the testing guide is a really, really amazing way for new contributors um, that are looking for a way to learn more um, about about Bitcoin Core or um, looking for ways to contribute value to the project to explore and, like Dave said, have fun. The testing guide is really kind of just a, um, a recipe book for people to get started on just having some ideas some ideas and things to explore. Yeah. David, thanks for hanging on for us um, to go through this item. We appreciate your time. You're welcome to stay on as we go through the notable code changes. Um, but if you, need, if you need a drop, we understand. Thanks. Thank you very much. Notable code and documentation changes. I'll take the opportunity to solicit any questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to request speaker access or comment on the Twitter thread. And we'll try to get that at the end of the show. First PR, Bitcoin Core 28950, updating the submit package RPC with arguments for max fee rate and max burn amount. Merch, I had seen that you were a reviewer on this particular PR, and I thought maybe you would be suited to explain it for the audience. Yeah, sure. So when you submit a package, you generally have, especially in the context of track transactions, where we will only have two transactions in the cluster, you generally have some child that is bumping the parent. And that's the point why you're trying to submit it as a package in the first place. So what this uh, PR does is it adds uh, two arguments to the submit package RPC, and it allows the user to um, limit the maximum fee rate and the maximum burn amount to in in the package. So, um, if you, for example, aren't quite sure what transaction uh, fee rate, or sorry, what what fee rate um, you're submitting, or um, you you want to have some sanity checks there that you don't accidentally overspend. You could have a custom max fee rate set in your uh, integration where you receive packages and then uh, once they're submitted, you run this um, argument as as a bound on how much you're going to pay. And the max burn amount is in the context of, for example, up return outputs or generally unspendable outputs. Um, this is usually set to zero, but if you were, for example, trying to assign a value to an up return output, uh, you could increase it um, in order to allow your RPC to accept that transaction. Thanks, Merch. Next PR this week is LND 8418. 
makes a change to LND when LND was computing the minimum fee for a transaction. LND will now look at its Bitcoin peers fee filter values in making a determination on LND's fee rates. The fee filter values come from the peer to peer fee filter message defined in BIP 133 that tells peers not to send transactions with fees below a certain fee rate. And so LND is now using a moving median calculation that is um, based on all of its outbound peers' fee filter rates to help inform its fee rate selection. Merchard, Dave, anything to add there? Uh, oh, go ahead, Merch. No, you go ahead. Um, I think this is an interesting approach. It's a little scary to me. Um, even your outbound peers are not... Um, there's just no guarantees of service there. Um, I am. Uh, this is only being used for a minimum fee. Uh, maybe it's okay. Like I said, it's just a, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but hopefully they've thought through this more than I have in just writing up this quick summary of what they do. Um, the concern I have here is that uh, your node uh randomly picks peers so when, when it first connects to the network it downloads a list of peers from a trusted source uh uh trusted in the technical sense not necessarily that you trusted um, and then it will connect to some of those peers and then it will ask them for the addresses of other peers and it will build a kind of an address book of uh, peers on the network and then when it starts up a new time uh, it will connect to some of those peers that it randomly selects. And we've had attacks in the past where people have been able to uh, pollute this address book with bad peers. I don't know that it's ever been exploited, but it's been possible in the past. Um, so it's just something that I think you want to be careful about is that these are just random people on the internet. And you know, would you go and just ask, you know, a bunch of random people on the street, you know, how much you should pay in transaction fees and trust that, um, especially if there might be an incentive for, I guess this is a terrible analogy, but if there might be an incentive for somebody to replace them with fake people who always tell you to pay a really lot in fees. So this is an approach. Um, I would urge anybody thinking about replicating this to go look at what LND did and be take a critical look at it. Thanks for that commentary, Dave. Yeah, so right, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, maybe maybe the context why they're doing this in the first place is interesting. So uh, the Lightning nodes uh, usually run on a thin client backend. And they do not have the mempool, so they cannot actually see what's going on or do a statistics-based fee rate estimation on what they saw in their mempool and got confirmed later. So essentially, they're they're blind. And previously, the approach has basically, I'm not sure if LND was using this approach, but I know some Lightning nodes were using the approach to just as soon as they see that the transaction didn't get confirmed, they just rebroadcast it with a higher fee rate until it at some point gets confirmed, which is completely blind, right? So in a way, if, if this is an additional source of information, that would be great. If it's the only source of information, yes, it's kind of scary in the context that they could lie to you and make you pay a lot of fees that you don't have to pay. Next three pull requests that we highlighted are all to the LDK repository. Jeff, thank you for hanging on for an hour and a half. We've we've crammed Optech content down your throat and, and made you wait. But the good news is you have three interesting PRs here that we can celebrate getting into LDK. And I'm excited for you to talk through some of these. So I, I guess I'll, I'll give you the floor. We can start with uh, 2756. Great. Uh, just checking if you could hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. And I don't think Great. you were a part of the intro, so say hi to folks and let them know what you're up to. Yeah, so my name is Jeff. I, I work at Spiral primarily on LDK, which is the Lightning Development Kit. Uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar, it's essentially a SDK for Lightning. Uh, we implement the Lightning Protocol for you, so you could just concentrate on building a great wallet. Uh, so 
we have a few PRs here um, that are kind of like pre prerequisites to some larger uh, features we want to get into LDK. Um, those notably would be uh, dual funding, splicing, and asynchronous payments. Uh, asynchronous payments are, you know, it's, it's still kind of early in the, the, the spec stage, but the other two, um, uh, that is blinding, uh, sorry, uh, dual funding and splicing are, are well along. So uh, to start off, we have LDK 2756, which adds uh, trampoline routing packets. Um, basically to the onion payload. And so for trampoline, this is um, a way for, for mobile, uh, particular mobile wallets that don't necessarily have the entire network graph um, in memory to uh, send payments to sort of like a intermediary node called the trampoline. And that would uh, then construct the path the rest of the way to the recipient. And so this is particularly important for asynchronous payments because uh, in asynchronous payments, the the sender or the receiver might be offline um, during the, I guess, the entire time of the, or during portions of the, the payment. So uh, for instance, the the sender, uh, they they may want to just tell their LSP, like, here's the payments. Um, when the receiver's online, can you forward it to them? And since they're likely a mobile node, uh, having trampoline to sort of, I guess, complete that payment is ideal. So this adds basically support for constructing onions that include that routing information. Um, next up on here is 2935, which is basically adding key send support to blinded paths. And so for those unfamiliar with blinded paths, that's part of the offers uh, spec where invoices can have essentially a, um, not just invoices, but I guess any messages and invoices have uh, a blinded portion of, of the, the hops. Usually it's, you know, it is the last few hops along that the path. And uh, when you are sending a payment, it adds basically privacy. I just lost Jeff, did you? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep, you're back. Yeah, I think it's when my screen turns off, it does that. Um, so, uh, it adds key send support to blinded paths. And this is also important for async payments because uh, you may imagine that the, the recipient of the payments, so this would be the, the person that uh, created the offer, uh, they might not be online when you request an invoice uh, in the, the Bolt 12 protocol. And because of that, we may have to return sort of like a static invoice to them. Um, this would be like their LSP who, who is more online, typically the LSP. And uh, with that, the, um, since there isn't a payment hash associated with one of these static invoices, we need to use key send to allow the recipient to claim the payment. Uh, so this adds that sort of support to blind the paths. And uh, let's see, any questions on that before I go on to the next, which is a little, uh, I guess, a different topic? Doesn't look like it. No, continue. All right. So. Um, those, so again, those are, are sort of like stepping stones to asynchronous payments. Um, the next one, uh, interactive transaction construction, is, is basically a, a prerequisite to dual funding and splicing. So in those two protocols, uh, there, the construction of the funding transaction uh, is, is not one-sided as it is in, in normal uh, Lightning interactions. So it, like Lightning started where the, the funder of the, the channel uh, gave UTXOs for uh, inputs, and that can that was used to construct the funding tra the transaction. And the, I guess the drawback of that is that the, the initiator of this, this channel has uh, outbound liquidity, but doesn't have inbound liquidity. And so that makes it tough to receive payments. So what dual funding does is allow both uh, counterparties of a channel to add essentially uh, their own UTXOs as inputs and um, allowing them to sort of have liquidity in both directions upon channel opening. Uh, splicing is a, um, a sort of a, uh, I guess, um, related protocol where you're able to add or remove funds from a channel. So both of these require some sort of interactivity between the counterparties to come t together and construct a funding transaction. And this interactive transaction construction protocol is basically a turn-based protocol where each 
uh, of the counterparties in the, the construction of the channel had a turn to either add an input or add an output uh, to this funding transaction. Um, and they basically go back and forth. And one may say, okay, I'm gonna add this input. Uh, the next person may say, uh, I have nothing to add. So um, let's just say transaction complete. Um, that brings it back to the original party who can then continue to either add or remove inputs. And um, the, their counterparty, once they, they see that, can continue onwards um, as well to do that. When they both uh, give a transaction complete, then the, the channel is ready to be funded. So um, that's when the sort of like the dual funding uh, and the, the, the slicing layers on top. I think your screen turned off again. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm back on. That's a nice feature of Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, yeah, interactive transaction construction is sort of this prerequisite step to get dual funding and splicing in. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, those are some features that a lot of our users really want uh, for their splicing. Very cool. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for coming on and, and walking us walking us through that. Um, in terms of these PRs being rolled into the next version and, and timing there and, and what you'd be looking for potentially from the audience, do you, do you want to wrap up with any anything on, the, on those topics? Yeah, so next release, hopefully two weeks, and um, these will definitely be in the next release. But again, these are just like prerequisites to getting these larger protocols in. So it's going to be uh, maybe another release or so for, for splicing and... Um, Async payments again is, is still sort of in the early spec phase. So while we may have like it is an experimental feature in the next few releases, um, it might take time before other protocols sort of, um, or sorry, other implementations kind of catch up with us too. So we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, big shout out to to Val and Ara kind of working on these PRs, and then Jervis and Bloomer on the, the the third PR that I mentioned, and Duncan as well. Actually, it was uh, quite a lift. Yeah, I I just wanted to jump in briefly. Um, what do, what is the roadmap plan here? Is uh, splicing going to be uh, compatible between different um, implementations? I know that Phoenix, for example, has uh, made the news with their splicing uh, implementation. Would we be able to use splicing between different implementations? How long is that going to take? Yeah, that, that is definitely the goal. I, I'm not sure as far as timeline, but uh, the people on the Claire's side of things, async, they um, they are definitely a part of that. Uh, Merch, I believe that Eclair is currently compatible with C Lightning's implementation of splicing. I know that they were working out some final compatibility issues, but I I think that was already there. Yeah, they. I, I I'm not as you know completely familiar, but I I do. But from my understanding is. That, the async side, uh, the Claire slash Phoenix, they they were early sort of in, in implementing this. So there may have been some incompatibilities early on, but those are, are now hopefully being addressed or if not already been addressed. I also just wanted to thank you all for working on trampoline routing. I think that's somewhere that uh, async has, you know, they they started that out. They did a bunch of work on it, you know, years ago. And I don't think any of the other implementations have picked up work on that. But it does seem like a really useful feature. So thank you all for working on that. Yeah, that's great too. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. We got a couple more PRs. You're welcome to stay on as we go through thanks. those. Yeah, thanks for your time. Rust Bitcoin 2549. This PR improves Rust Bitcoin's API around time locks. The author of this PR, in terms of motivation, he ran into limitations in the current handling of lock times in the API. And so he made this pull request, which resolved three separate issues on the repository. He added some constructors, and the PR also adds the ability to convert relative time locks into sequences. And then there's also some under the hood updates as well. So if you're doing time locked Rust Bitcoin stuff, take a look at that. And last PR this week, BTC Pay Server 5852, which adds support for BBQR, PSBTs. As a reminder, BBQR is a scheme to encode larger files into a series of QR codes. Um, so the, the series of QR codes is commonly referred to like an animated QR code. You may have seen these before. And BBQR can be used with other file types 
but the main motivation for Bitcoin and the office of the BBQ PR or um, spec is for encoding BIP 174 PSBTs in these animated QRs. So the idea is that you could use these animated QR images to pass partially signed Bitcoin transactions to air gap devices. And now with this PR, BTC Pay has support for scanning in those animated BBQ QRs and parsing the resulting PSBT information. Merce likes it. Anything to add, Merce or Dave? Yeah, I, th- I mean, uh, maybe just for context, uh... A lot of these really small devices, they don't have awesome cameras. So making, putting more information in a QR code would make the um, dots on the QR code so much smaller. And I think you would at some point get resolution issues. So the idea is just to basically instead give a sequence of smaller parts of the total information in the animation. and that allows them to transfer all of the information that they couldn't scan in a single QR code. So we've reported on this previously. Looks pretty cool. Uh, Dave, you might have more sane stuff to say about this. Oh, I just think that standard QR codes, I believe the upper limit there is like 8,100 bytes. Um, and it's really easy to create a PSVT larger than that because one of the things that you often have to include in PSPTs is copies of previous transactions, uh, particularly for legacy transactions, and a lot of uh, signers require them also for SegWit V0 transactions uh, because of a, uh, uh, an interesting fee attack that, that's theoretically possible, pretty challenging to pull off. Um, but yeah, because you have to include entire copies of previous transactions into a PSPT in many cases, it's really easy for them to get up beyond the maximum size that's possible with a a static QR code. So these animated codes are just moving past that uh, bite size limitation. I don't see any requests for speaker access or questions other than a BitVM question for you, Merch, which I'll let you handle offline. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks to Jeff for sticking around and talking about LDK stuff. David, thank you for hanging around as well and walking us through the testing guide. Thanks to Abubakar, Peter Todd, and Dave Harding for also chiming in on the news sections. And as always, to my co-host, Merch, and for you all for listening. Cheers.